Okay. So welcome to this symposium. My name is Rupert Reed. Um, we're looking today at Wittgenstein's Liberatory Philosophy. Um, the first thing I want to say about this book is uh, please don't buy it. Um, it's uh, rather absurdly expensive. Uh, what I would like to urge you to do uh, is to uh, order it through your library or access it through your university library. Um, if you really want to have your own copy, then the ebook is not uh, absurdly priced. I'm hoping that in due course, like all my other outlet books, this will be paperbacked, but um, as yet it's only in hardback and it's big and expensive and don't buy it. So that's the, I wanted to get that uh, out of the way uh, up front. Um, what's going to happen here this afternoon at this special Wittgenstein workshop, this uh, mini symposium, um, is that I'm going to make some opening remarks uh, about uh, the book um, to give you context. I know that a few of you have read it. I know that a number of you have read the introduction to it, uh, and uh, some of you haven't read uh, any of it, I believe. Uh, so I'm going to make some opening remarks to give us some context. Uh, we're then going to have a, a response by um, Dr. Catherine Morris and a response by Dr. Ian McGilchrist. I uh, will then have a little cross-talk between uh, myself and the two of them, and we'll then open it up to general uh, questions and discussion, uh, and we're uh, aiming to finish um, at uh, seven o'clock. Um, uh, without further ado, I intend to proceed, uh, unless uh, anyone has any procedural uh, questions um, before I do. Uh, if there's anything like that, feel free to put it in the chat. Okay, so Wittgenstein's Liberatory Philosophy, what's it all about? So this book is um, the attempt that I've made uh, over a long period of time, um, based on um, work I've done mostly by myself, but also um, with a bunch of other people, most notably uh, Phil Hutchinson, um, to put together a kind of a new interpretation of uh, Wittgenstein's um, philosophy, uh, and in particular of the philosophical investigations. Um, it's a sort of post-therapeutic interpretation, one might say. Um, what I aim to do in the book is to marry the resolute reading of uh, Wittgenstein, uh, which I'm still very much an advocate of, um, with the um, reading of Wittgenstein due to the uh, later Gordon Baker, uh, who is um, the, probably the single most important influence uh, on the book. Um, and um, by way of bringing those together to attempt to offer a reading of all the most, what I consider to be the most important moments in the philosophical investigations. So an outline kind of schematic uh, reading, not, it's not like an exegesis of every paragraph, nowhere near, uh, but it hopes to give you a kind of sense of how the book could be read according to this uh, liberatory prism, a prism which draws on Wittgenstein's famous remark about the importance of finding the liberating word in philosophy, but also gives chapter and verse from numerous points in the investigations where I think this uh, liberatory um, um, framework, uh, rhetoric conception is, is visible um, far more often than, than a therapeutic conception uh, is, uh, is visible. Uh, in the course of doing this, obviously, I expound what I mean by uh, a liberatory philosophy. Um, and uh, we might start there with the idea of being uh, liberated from uh, pictures that hold us captive, uh, which, of course, is a key passage relevant to this in the investigations. Um, and I aim to open up there by a space of autonomy. Uh, I use that word advisedly. Um, I make a connection with, uh, with Kant. Uh, and suggest that Wittgenstein gives us what we might think of as a sort of radically reconceived uh, version of, of Kant. He gives us a version of autonomy which can actually uh, work, in particular a version of autonomy which is not um, one that fetishizes freedom or liberty. And that's a very important uh, point, that um, in order to be consistently liberatory, uh, I make the argument that um, you have to make sure you don't get captured by anything including the idea of being liberatory. So the book in that sense uh, self-applies or suggests that Wittgenstein's philosophy in this regard um, self-applies. Also crucially, very differently from Kant and also differently from the later uh, Gordon Baker, um, I argue that we will misunderstand this uh, conception of liberation that I'm outlining and detailing um, if we take it to be one which is in any sense um, antisocial, in any sense um, individualist, 
Um, I argue that, in fact, it turns out that when you really think it through, the Wittgenstein, uh, putting it in a, in a paradoxical way, as I do uh, increasingly as the book goes on, autonomy is relationality. Um, that uh, our true uh, freedom uh, is to find ourselves and to find our feet um, with other people. And that this is true both um, in philosophy in terms of how you must pursue philosophical method, but also more broadly than that in terms of uh, society and the world. Uh, and I argue that, for example, by reference to the, uh, the so-called anti-private uh, language argument, uh, which uh, I reread in a way which seeks to bring out uh, this uh, fundamental social, relational, and indeed um, caring uh, uh, dimension. Um, that takes me uh, towards the, the end of the book where I seek to draw out some further implications from this liberatory conception, including um, um, political and civilizational um, uh, implications, drawing on Wittgenstein's remarks, both in the investigations uh, and elsewhere, to suggest that Wittgenstein's philosophy, his liberatory philosophy, which is simultaneously a philosophy of relationality, a philosophy of, uh, of an ethics of, uh, of care and an ethics of sociality, is one that is uh, peculiarly relevant uh, to our time, peculiarly relevant, that is, to a time in which we do tend to fetishize uh, uh, freedom uh, in a destructive uh, way. Um, in which we fail to achieve freedom because, for example, we fail to recognize that fetish and we fail to recognize the extent to which we are deeply in hock to uh, assumptions uh, along the lines of uh, that our culture, that our society um, progresses uh, and will continue to do so endlessly into the future. Uh, and I seek to draw out the dimension of Wittgenstein's philosophy, which is um, often implicit in the investigations and explicit elsewhere, uh, which points us uh, in this direction and operates thereby um, as um, a kind of um, cultural critique, um, obviously. Um, I hope that people will find the, the work um, provocative. Uh, it takes aim at uh, a, a number of existing um, um, positions uh, and um, um, consensuses even. Uh, for example, I, I suggest that, that we need to rename the anti-private language argument and offer some suggestions accordingly. Uh, I systematically critique the, the influential Baker and Hacker reading. As already mentioned, although Baker, the later Baker, is the single greatest influence on the book, um, I seek to uh, critique um, his uh, unwillingness, as I see it, to enter into this um, uh, relational um, community aspect um, sufficiently. Um, and uh, indeed, I critique some of my own uh, previous work, especially when that work has been too uncritical uh, about metaphors of, uh, of therapy uh, and the like. Um, I'm quite proud of the book. Um, I'd love you to, to read it and see what you think of it. I'd love to uh, get people's responses to it. I'm sure we'll get some of that starting uh, here today. Uh, and I've taken about 10 minutes there to outline what I try to do in the book. I'm going to leave it at that uh, and going to give a chance to the two distinguished colleagues who I've asked to be discussants here today at this symposium to come in and give uh, their take. Uh, and um, we'll then have some uh, discussion, as I've said. Um, so the one who is going to go first is, uh, is Catherine Morris. I'm absolutely delighted that Catherine uh, is here uh, today for a number of reasons, but one quite obvious reason is that uh, the late great Gordon Baker had uh, two very distinguished um, collaborators, co-authors in the course of his life. In the early part of his uh, career, his main collaborator was uh, was Peter Hacker. As I say, uh, I'm a strong critic of, uh, of that uh, reading and I detail the criticisms uh, in this book. But in the latter part of his career, his, uh, his key collaborator was uh, Catherine her, herself. So she, if you will, keeps alive a, a lot of that legacy of uh, Gordon Baker's absolutely vital uh, later work uh, on Wittgenstein and on um, uh, the, something like the idea of a liberatory philosophy, uh, which he draws um, from uh, Weissman and which I hope to have developed. So it really is a great privilege and an honor to have Catherine here today. And I would like to invite you, Catherine, to uh, uh, address us and to say uh, what you think of the, the book and um, well, whatever it is that, uh, that you want to say. Uh, is your uh, microphone on? Yes, uh, I think Catherine? so. Great, then over to you. Okay, thanks Rupert. Um, uh, um, I, I see I'm 
up on the screen as MANS0097, which is not very helpful for anyone, but that's me. Um, I'll begin just with a few general remarks. Um, first of all, um, I'm inclined to agree that liberatory is a better word than therapeutic. But as I think we've sometimes had some discussions uh, about this, I'm not entirely sure that the conception of therapy that you're kind of resisting would be one that all therapists would necessarily buy into. And I, I would really like Richard at some stage to kind of chip in on that a little bit because I don't think he's the kind of therapist that you're um, critical of in, in talking about um, uh, and, and critically talking about therapeutic philosophy. Um, but on the whole, I'm inclined to agree that what, for example, Baker really emphasizes um, much more than any kind of strict analogy with Freudian psychotherapy is that notion of liberation. Um, um, second general remark, I'm really delighted to have this book out. Um, uh, um, to have, if you like, I mean, this partly for purely pedagogical reasons. I think maybe some of my students are there in the audience, though I can't see them on the screen. Um, but um, to have a commentary on the investigations, which in a, in a way I think this book really counts as, is to, um, uh, one that comes from this therapeutic stroke liberatory perspective is wonderful. There are loads of commentaries on the investigations, but n none really that comes from this perspective. And that's, it'll be great to be able to assign that to my students. Um, uh, third general point, I, I'm mainly just going to be picking up on a few remarks in, in Rupert's concluding chapter. Um, so, and one, one thing I just wanted to pick up on, which I think is really important, um, Rupert says in that concluding chapter that he's less concerned to see his book as a reading of Wittgenstein. Obviously, he's not going to see it as the right or the only way to read him. Uh, that would be completely contrary to the whole spirit of the book. Um, to, to see it that way. But he's less concerned to see the, his book as a reading of Wittgenstein uh, than to establish the possibility, the possibility of a liberatory philosophy. Um, so I think that's a good point to make, although it's immediately some Wittgensteinians in the group are going to say, but I'm perfectly sure. Okay, so much for general remarks. Um, so Rupert has already said um, that his kind of main criticism, or at least one of his main criticisms of Baker's reading, uh, uh, the, uh, I read um, when I say Baker, I, I always mean the later Baker. Uh, um, but uh, his, his, his main criticism of later Baker's reading of Wittgenstein um, is Baker's insistence that therapy is always directed at individuals. Um, so it's partly this I really want to explore. Now, Hacker, um, who um, both I and Rupert are critical of, um, makes what looks at least superficially a similar point in his um, very critical article, posthumously written uh, on, on Baker's, uh, the later Baker's reading of Wittgenstein, where he says, um, contra, what he takes to be contra Baker, that Wittgenstein addressed grand schools of thought, such as logicism. He addressed grand doctrines, such as Platonism. And he addressed pervasive, misconceived ways of thinking. He takes that to be anti-Baker. 
And I've actually replied in writing to this um, as follows. But doesn't Baker acknowledge this when he points out that um, motivated misconceptions are rooted in particular ways of thinking, which may be idiosyncratic, but are apt to be more or less widely shared within one's whole culture, or at least one's intellectual milieu. And I go on to suggest, um, to ask, is there any incompatibility between saying that hysteria may have been widespread among a, a particular class of women at a particular period in, say, Vienna, uh, is there any incompatibility between that and the thought that therapy is to be directed at particular individuals? And I add, um, moreover, is it inconceivable that one patient might receive from benefit, uh, some benefit from reading another's case history? Um, and indeed, one might go further and suggest that Baker's focus on individual thinkers is not so much contrasting individuals with the wider culture, why should he or we see these as wholly separate, but contrasting people with ab abstract propositions or abstract sets of propositions. Mm. So I, I've said that uh, in writing already. However, I, I think that Rupert, uh, Rupert's point goes much deeper than Hacker's and that consequently my response to Hacker um, won't satisfy Rupert. After all, he wants to see a potential political um, payoff to liberatory philosophy. And I certainly don't see Hacker doing that. And so I'm not gonna say a lot about this, obviously partly because you're gonna be talking about this in more detail at your next event from what I understand. But I just wanna raise a couple of questions. Okay, so one point which I do understand and I'm inclined to agree with is um, an analogy that Rupert draws between the sort of unconscious pictures that Wittgenstein um, and especially Baker's and Rupert's Wittgenstein uh, em emphasize. So the idea of, of our being in the grip of certain unconscious pictures. So Rupert then draws an analogy between such unconscious pictures and what Marx and Gramsci call ideologies, um, which Rupert for, further characterizes as ideology masquerading as common sense ideology with a veil of invisibility. Um, and he names at least one piece. From, from this, we can kind of go on to the idea of a hegemonic ideology. And Rupert names one of these as scientism. Um, and uh, he's named various other things. And uh, so far, I'm kind of inclined to agree. Um, uh, the idea of, of widely shared um, prejudices, as I, as I would sometimes want to put it, um, which become kind of, so to speak, naturalized. And as Bourdieu puts it, um, um, there are bits of history turned into nature and hence not recognized as such. Um, uh, and so here, here are at least some of the questions that are in my mind. Um, one is a kind of worry that in deeply divided societies like ours and like the US, deeply divided as reflected in some extraordinarily close votes um, both in the US, both a few months ago and four years before that, and of course Brexit um, in, our, in, in uh, the UK. Um, and wondering whether we can still talk about hegemonic ideologies in such deeply divided societies, um, or whether 
we kind of we need the notion of multiple hegemonies. I'm not quite sure. But also, um, so that's just kind of one question. I just don't quite know. I, I think even with scientism, um, I think it's absolutely hegemonic within British or Anglo-American uh, philosophy. I'm less clear that it's hegemonic in our society insofar as respect for science. Um, one would sometimes like more respect for science, especially at this moment in, in time um, when scientists are telling us that um, we need to keep our distance and all that kind of thing. Um, and a lot of people are showing a disrespect for science, perhaps, in their behavior. So that, that, that's one kind of question. Um, uh, as usual, I'm, I'm not very, I'm not nearly as articulate as Rufert is, but I mean, obviously, and again, I suspect we're not going to be able to get into this too clearly. I kind of have a notion of how one uses the kinds of techniques that Wittgenstein puts forward to try to unhook somebody from uh, some individual from a picture. And at the moment, I'm less clear how one unhooks a whole society from an ideology. So I'll just ask those two questions, um, which I'm sure Rupert will have some responses to. Mm. And let me stop there. Marvellous. Thank you so much, Catherine. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, I, I'm dying to respond, but I'm not going to. I'm going to wait and hold back uh, and uh, let our second discussant come in uh, first, and then I'll make a bit of a response to you both, and then we can have a, a, a bit of uh, uh, crosstalk among the three of us. Um, so the second discussant, um, well, I, I think Catherine's remarks lead very, very nicely into some of the areas of his main expertise. It's an absolute honour to have my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Ian McGilchrist here, um, author of um, um, The Master and His Emissary, uh, for those of you who don't know it, one of the most important uh, works, I would say, by any uh, living author. Um, something which is striking about that book is it, its polymathic uh, nature uh, and the way that it is um, seeking to bring together um, philosophers and others who are often not brought together. And one of those philosophers is Wittgenstein. Um, Wittgenstein is by no means the philosopher who Ian is, is closest to, but he has, I think, a brilliant um, uh, and original things to say about Wittgenstein uh, in that book. And that's one of the reasons why I invited him to uh, come here uh, and, and speak uh, today. Um, so, um, Ian, um, thank you so much, and uh, over to you for your uh, response. Well, thank you very much indeed for asking me along, and I, I feel very much the interloper here. Um, I'm not a Wittgenstein scholar. Um, I'm just somebody who has read and learnt from Wittgenstein a bit, and no doubt probably misunderstood him. But the issues that you raise in your book are very um, close to those that are important to me. Um, and I'll try and convey that as briefly as I can. Um, the, the issue of a perspective is very important because all philosophy is in a way personal. Um, there is a kind of sleight of hand whereby some philosophers um, imagine or like to pretend that they're speaking from a, a sort of um, position of objective um, uh, omniscience, really. Um, whereas, in fact, of course, philosophy is deeply bound up with the personalities of those who philosophize. Um, and uh, in the West at the moment, there is a tendency to select for a certain way of relating to the world, which has very little to do with the second person and much more to do with the first and third person. That's of interest to me because of two things, really. Um, one is that in schizophrenia, um, which is uh, a part of a spectrum which includes autism, or certain kinds of autism at any rate, in both these conditions, there is a confusion 
often about the, the person uh, in, in the grammatical sense in which one is speaking and the sense that one is being spoken about or um, treated as an object or is omniscient. So that there is a sort of a, a, um, a varying between two extreme positions, that of total omniscience and, and of being actually the, the, the container of all that is known. Um, and in that sense, having a sort of omniscient eye position and of being a nothing who is outside and simply inspecting the self from a third person perspective. What these two things have in common, and I'm sure you can see they have quite a lot in common actually, is their grandiosity, their inability to accept humbly that one is actually what one is in relation only to other people, that there is no such thing as an individual that is somehow separate from the, the culture, the, the genetic pool, the, the civilization out of which um, we all come and to which we return. Philosophy is inevitably moral, it seems to me, as well as personal. It can't avoid either of these two things because the kind of attention that is paid is a key point, and I'm very glad, Rupert, that you have a lot to say about attention. Um, I'm going to make some remarks under three headings. One is to do with attention, one is to do with relations, and the third is to do with the approach of Wittgenstein and the approach of philosophers in general. About attention, attention is a moral act in itself. This is because how you attend changes what it is you find in the world. And it also changes who you are. So that your experience of the world is quite different depending on how you attend. And not only because the world changes, the world that is present for you, but also because you change. So it, attention is always a linking between, it's a forming of a relationship or the, or the um, vivifying, the energizing of a relationship that is latent. And you, um, I think, probably quoting Wittgenstein, say that one looks into his face, the suffering person. That's different from looking at uh, the suffering person. Now, why is that important? Because, again, in uh, schizophrenia and autism, there is a sort of um, withdrawal from... Um, one's connectedness with the world and with other people. And, and you know, it's no, no disrespect to Wittgenstein to say that it's very well known that he had grave difficulties in social relations, as many people who are on the autistic spectrum do. And I wonder if a lot of his work was actually working out for himself um, a satisfactory, a better and more satisfactory way of conceiving his relation to the world. Perhaps that's what a lot of philosophy is about. In the beginnings of philosophy, well, perhaps not quite the beginnings in the West, but when one thinks of Plato, Plato is always philosophizing in the second person and famously was um, antipathic to the idea of a philosophy that was written in which the philosopher was not present. And Andrew Pinsent has actually interestingly written a book recently called The Second Person Perspective in Aquinas' Ethics, in which he makes a number of very important points about how Aquinas is different in this respect from Aristotle. And you, Rupert, say, I don't mean uh, when you talk about connectedness that the self-other distinction gets entirely effaced. Not at all. As I explained, that would be too easy. Well, I'd say, yes, it is much too easy, but it's not really as though what we're talking about is a mid-situation between the first-person perspective and the third-person perspective. A second-person perspective is radically different from either of these two possibilities. And oddly enough, one's individuality, um, rather than being swallowed up in relationship, is nourished in relationship. A good relationship is one in which the two individuals, if it's a, an individual to individual relationship, neither of them engulfs the other or is swallowed up by the other, but also in which 
they remain connected. And in that um, wholesome relationship, each of them becomes more themselves rather than less themselves through relationship. You say staying too much in the would be utterly spectatorial third person or stuck within the first person has been philosophy's bane. Such objectivity and subjectivity, far from being opposites, are but two sides of the same kind, to which I say here, here, a very important point, and I think you link that in a footnote to the work of Louis Sass, which I find fascinating, and I know you do. Though we can talk about that later if people are interested. The second point I'd like to make is about relations, and it stems seamlessly from what I've been saying that we might conceive that relations are things that come post factum. So there are entities, there are individuals, there are things, and the relations are added to or supervene on um, those existences. But in many important respects, that is not the case. In fact, I, in a book I've just delivered to the press, um, I argue that relations come before relata. The, re the relata emerge in the process of the evolving relationships. And this is true of human development. Children are not born feeling isolated and then learn by watching others that they seem to have feelings internally and do a sort of um, virtual reality idea that, oh, when a person looks sad, um, they must be feeling what I feel when I'm sad. The process of evolution in the first two years of life is one away from a sense of complete intersubjectivity towards one in which one sees that one is actually distinct from the mother. And it usually is an importantly, from an um, evolutionary psychology point of view, uh, will probably remain the mother. Um, in that relationship, there now comes to be some degree of distance. This is what is managed over the first 18 months of life, that the two are not fused, but that it is perfectly safe because now there is an even richer sense of each of them being in relationship with the other. And of course, if you're fused, there can be no relationship. There can be no second person. I liked also the way in which you image this using an image from physics that you call it the atomic prejudice writ large across philosophy uh, and and you suggest that it should give way to something more like a field conception there's an enormous amount that could be said about that and again it's a topic i deal with um, in my forthcoming book but i just mentioned that david mermin um, who's a physicist has written quite specifically uh, to the point that relations are prior to relata and to the paradoxical relationship between the, the individual entity as part of a field will collapse to a point, these two um, possibilities obviously e existing, um, at least at the atomic level. But I think it makes a nice image actually for what we're discussing. And I think the third thing I'd like to say is about, and again, it follows from what I've been saying, is about the approach. Um, yeah. You emphasize repeatedly, Rupert, that. Um... Ian, can I interrupt? Yes. I'm just concerned that we seem to have lost Rupert. Somebody muted that Mark might be the host in his absence, but Rupert doesn't seem to be on. Um, and I don't know if anyone knows how to get him back or whether we've got a stand-in host who can get him back. Rupert is just, just, just texting me that he's lost the connection. He's trying to get back. In, he's the trying host, to get back. Yeah. Yeah. So I think he will have missed um, a lot of what you said. <laughs> are you really there rupert yeah he's back now all oh, right okay he's not on my screen but there we are oh i can't speak he says um hey ho 
Um, he may well have um, missed uh, virtually uh, all of what I had to say, but I'm sure that um, that will be fine. <laughs> um, uh, so to conclude, yes, yeah, some comments that Rupert has made about philosophy as not um, compelling a conclusion, um, but as it were guiding one towards a point of view, which I strongly believe is how philosophy works. It doesn't ever finally, um, uh, as it were, force its conclusion on anyone. But uh, as he says, the philosopher treats a question like an illness, which makes me wonder why he's so opposed actually to the idea of the therapeutic model. I think it's because he, I hope I'm not misunderstanding him, that he thinks of therapy or says that he thinks of therapy quite often as something that is done to another person. Whereas my understanding of therapy is that it is a, um, a, a, a dyad and that both the uh, therapist and the person who's receiving therapy are in a sort of constant exchange. I mean, there is a kind of old bad type, omniscient and remote. Um, and I don't think many people practice that now. I think it's rather a damaging kind of therapy myself. But instead, uh, instead of taking a direct line, uh, Wittgenstein circles around. Um, I like this image of the circular movement, because I think in a way what one's getting is different adumbrations of the topic, rather than being driven down a line towards a conclusion that you are forced to accept. And in guiding somebody to a philosophical position, it seems to me important to be taking a secular motion, not a linear motion. Dunn somewhere in one of the satires says that truth is like, um, it, it sits on a cragged hill that is very steep and he that would reach it must about go and about go round the mountain to find it. Um, so I would say that philosophy is um, rather a kind of therapy in which one's helping others and helping oneself. It's a kind of care, as he says, um, these are his words, philosophy is a kind of, a, of care achieved mutually. And that is probably what the best of therapy and the best of medicine is. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ian. Yeah, uh, tragically, I got, I got thrown out of Zoom. I have no idea what happened. Some kind of weird error message came up. Uh, at the very moment, at the very moment you started to speak, <laughs> and I only caught the end of your remarks there, but I'll do my best to respond to what I did here. Um, luckily, what you said obviously connects up with what uh, Catherine said. So, so let me say something about uh, therapy, and then something about what Catherine said about um, ideology, uh, and then uh, give the, the two of you a chance to, uh, to, to come back before we go uh, wider. So on therapy, look, I don't want to exaggerate um, uh, how um, uh, my negativity now towards therapy, I, I'm still immensely positive to uh, much of what people mean when they talk about philosophy as therapy in a Wittgensteinian uh, way. And indeed, chapter five of the book um, is, uh, is about that. It's more really that, uh, as both of you suggested, uh, I think there are certain kind of dangers, limitations, etc. Uh, to the, the, the therapy um, metaphor, especially if it gets taken in the wrong way, as it often has been. And it's more also of a comparative point. I still think there's quite a lot going for, for the, uh, the therapy metaphor. It's just that I think there's a lot more going for the liberation metaphor uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and I think, uh, as I say at one point in the book, that what is most, what people are trying to express by the therapy uh, metaphor um, can usually be brought out better through the liberation metaphor, or actually, I, mean, I don't really think of it as a metaphor. I think of it as, as in a certain sense, more than, more than that. Um, so I'm not sure that there is actually that much substantive disagreement between any of the three of us on the therapy uh, question. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss it more. And I also welcome Catherine's suggestion um, that uh, that we should bring in, uh, among others, Richard Gipps on, on this as someone who's, uh, who, like Ian, has got his hands on, uh, on the matter. Um, on the ideologies uh, um, thing, um, again, I thought uh, Catherine's remarks were very well taken. I really interested in, in her thought of uh, what does hegemony mean in a society like ours, which has become deeply divided. I think she's right to say that there's, 
that I, I might be a little bit simplistic at times the way that in the book I talk about scientism as hegemonic where in fact what I mean is something like it's hegemonic um, within um, most of the dominant reaches of society including uh, the academy and philosophy and this is something which Ian also brings out brilliantly um, in his book and I think that uh, Catherine's suggestion that we might start talking about multiple hegemonies is useful, or I was thinking as she spoke, maybe even conflicting uh, hegemonies might be a useful uh, turn of phrase. But I do think it still also makes good sense to talk about ideologies that are more genuinely hegemonic. So if scientism is no longer genuinely hegemonic, then let me name a couple of other um, ideologies that I think are, and that are also within um, the, uh, the target of my critique uh, in the book uh, and elsewhere, um, growthism and technophilia. So growthism, the, the doctrine that what society should be chiefly about is trying to grow uh, the economy. Uh, incredibly, this is still uh, absolutely taken for granted uh, in the media and across virtually the entirety uh, of the academy, although you know, the resistance is uh, growing. Um, and the, the the uh, resistance um, to uh, growthism in the wider society is also growing, but is still very small. So I think it's fair to say that growthism as an ideology is still hegemonic. And technophilia, and that's of course an interesting one because it's quite closely related to uh, scientism and was also something that Wittgenstein was very um, concerned about. Uh, the love of technology or the worship of technology, the idea that there will be a techno fix to whatever um, we, um, whatever problems we encounter. I think, again, that ideology remains uh, hegemonic, even with the uh, conflicts that have grown around, uh, around science. Um, and very few of those who are um, um, questioning or, or being ignorant in relation to science uh, actually make the same kind of questioning with regard to technology. You might argue, by the way, that that shows that they're not actually serious in their questioning of, uh, of science. And it's obviously a much more sophisticated <laughs> critique of, of scientism that is present in Wittgenstein or indeed in, uh, in McGilchrist. Um, and um, I'm really worried by the hegemony of technophilia, um, partly because of the situation we're in right now. Um, if the vaccines uh, are successful this year, which is not um, by any means as certain, I think, as most people think. But uh, if they are successful this year, I'm worried that that will be a big boost to, uh, to technophilia, uh, as well as a potentially a boost to scientism. Um, I am concerned about scientism in the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic response as well. We could talk about that if people want. Um, uh, and I'm worried that that will fuel um, um, a techno fix approach to the fundamental problems of uh, of ecological devastation, which result from um, the um, hegemonic ideology of growth uh, and indeed of progress, which of course is one that Wittgenstein uh, himself explicitly discussed. I think that the, that the, the concept of progress is still basically um, uh, hegemonic. Um, and I think that if that happens, that will um, put us in completely the wrong um, context for addressing the uh, uh, um, the, the, the tragic and, and awesome challenges uh, of the 2020s, which I think actually need to be challenged by much more fundamentally freeing ourselves from the, uh, from the concepts which um, uh, imprison us in the kind of way that I've, uh, I've sketched uh, in this book um, and elsewhere. Um, so those are my responses, such as they are. I think they would have been stronger if I'd have heard more than 20% uh, of what Ian uh, said. But there you go. We are where we are. And I look forward to other people taking up uh, some of Ian's remarks and to watching them later myself. Uh, Catherine uh, or Ian, would you like to uh, come back at all on, on those things that I just said? I, I, I could. Um... Yes, the part that you um, missed me talking about was really about relationship, uh, the, the, the foundational nature of relations, not just in people, but actually in the world at large, that I argued that, well, I didn't argue now, but I do argue that um, relations are prior to relata. And what, much of what you're saying, um, for me, links to the fact that we have an I-it relationship to 
the world at large, to nature and to society, um, <clears throat> not a, an I-thou relationship, not that second person relationship. And as I tried to suggest, that nature of such a relationship changes not just what is seen, but the seer. The one who is attending is changed by the nature of the attention and yes. the thing that is seen is altered by the kind of attention. And as you know, I associate this with the rise of certain ways of thinking, which are um, black and white, um, categorical, over certain, um, uh, and uh, lacking in, um, what should one say, nuance or the understanding of implicit meaning uh, in our society, which are all aspects of both um, left hemisphere function and in some respects of the schizo-autistic spectrum. So I would link what you've just said about the crises that we face, and you know that I entirely agree with you about all of that. I would link that back to this very important point about the second person mm. uh, relationship. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Ian. Uh, and I'm so glad you brought up the second person because uh, if I'd have been speaking for longer at the start, I'd have said something about that a very important dimension um, of my uh, book. Um, among the influences on my book are uh, Hannes uh, Nikon and, and Joel Backstrom, the, the Finnish Wittgensteinians, who have been strongly emphasizing in, in very recent years the importance of taking seriously the second person um, in understanding Wittgenstein and more generally in philosophy, which is something I try to build on in the book. And I uh, uh, critique uh, their way of doing it because I argue that like uh, the later Baker, um, they fail to um, to see how the second person can be a relationship between many and one or one and many as well as between one and one. In other words, I suggest <laughs> that it's it's possible to uh, for for a um, for um, a, a dyad or a, a group to to have a, a relation with uh, one uh, other, which is second personal uh, or vice versa, uh, and that we shouldn't. Uh, get ourselves trapped in thinking about the second person, in thinking about only a relation between one being and a single other being, because that retraps us potentially in individualism. Uh, but yes, uh, the, the second person is, is critically important to the book. And I love also that you brought up, Ian, um, the importance of um, really taking uh, Relata seriously in the way that I try to do in the second half of the book. And if I may, I'm just gonna quote from the final paragraph uh, of the book, a, a little remark about this, um, where I suggest that the, the, the version of liberation, which is genuinely relational that I'm uh, reaching for here, quote, expresses the loving understanding that one cannot make sense of liberation for some without liberation for all, including non-human beings. Um, and that in, in restricting um, our sort of political interest to uh, human beings alone, we've made a kind of, uh, historic error, almost one might say a, a, a category error. Um, yeah. Catherine, do you want to, to uh, come back and then I think we'll throw it open to the to the broader group. Um, I don't think so at this moment. I make I may oh, jump fine. in when when other people make their points. Yeah. Can I just ask you directly then? What did you think about my suggestion that there there do remain uh, hegemonic ideologies, even if scientism, as you note, is perhaps no longer one? Again, I'm I'm kind of inclined to agree, and I, I um and again, I do think that scientism is hegemonic. Um, within certain institutions, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, I'm partly I just don't have a very clear idea. Um, um, but I'm no, I'm I'm I, I'm perfectly content to suggest uh, to to accept your suggestion that there are these other uh, hegemonic ideologies apart from scientism, and some of them quite closely related to scientism. Yeah. Great, great. Okay, well then um, it's six o'clock. Let's uh, throw it open to our, our large and distinguished um, audience here to get involved. Uh, feel free to um, uh, 
direct your question to one of us in particular or to more than one of us or simply to make um, a, a remark. Um, everyone is uh, able to uh, unmute themselves and to start their video if they want to do so. So um, I'm going to invite people to put in the chat if they want to uh, ask a question or also you if you wish you can uh, you can raise your hands. Um, but preferably don't just start talking because we then might then have several people who try to start talking at once. So uh, raise your hand or put something in the chat. And we've got a first question here from uh, Costas. Hi, Costas. <clears throat> Hi, Rupert. Can you hear me okay? I can. Yes. Good, good to see you. Good to hear you again after so many years. Um, yeah. And by the way, I want to congratulate you for your environmental and green uh, concerns. I'm teaching some of your talks in BBC to my pupils in high schools in Scotland. So well, well done. Thank you now, very much. But I want to be a little bit controversial. Um, I'm a fan of Paul Feuerabend, right? Now, um, why should I look at your book uh, having in mind that Paul Feuerbach made a very good analysis as a fan of Feuerbach, I think he made a very good analysis of philosophical investigations very close to the way you uh, approach um, liberation and the philosophy of liberation. That's number one. And I also like very well the way he treats uh, scientism, scientism um, across the panel. And we saw uh, both in terms of how climate change is treated, but also in terms of how COVID is treated, that scientism, scientism as a phenomenon actually um, goes against uh, the, the, the true environmental concerns or the true concerns about the welfare of the people. Thank you very much, Rupert. Well, thank you, Costas, for, for those um, uh, lovely remarks. Uh, you've opened up a, a huge potential topic there. I'm not going to try and go into it uh, very much. Uh, I'll say very briefly that I have quite a lot of admiration for Foyer event as well, although uh, it, within the philosophy of science, uh, I'm much closer to Thomas Kuhn who I have also argued at length in print is, uh, is someone we should see as having a, a major Wittgensteinian uh, inheritance. I believe my co-author Wes Sharrock is on the, on the call. Maybe Wes would like to say something um, in that connection. Wes and I do make some criticisms of, uh, of Feuer events um, uh, in our book, partly from a sort of broadly Wittgensteinian uh, um, uh, perspective. Um, uh, but look, yeah, um, clearly uh, Feuer event had some um, strong uh, criticisms, uh, many of them very well taken, um, of, of scientism. Uh, and um, I agree with you that some of what Feuer event wrote about uh, Wittgenstein uh, was, uh, was impressive and, and stands the test of time. So I, I, th I don't think we're a million miles away from each other uh, there. Um, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to go next to uh, Richard um, to come in as advertised on the therapy analogy. Richard Gibbs. Hi, Rupert. Thanks for that. Hi. And um, fa fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm still looking forward to reading your book. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. So I, I was thinking, I, I mean, I don't really care, like, if you call it um, liberatory or therapeutic, and maybe liberatory is better and so on. So I, I don't have any axe to grind, but I just wanted to kind of like just, just put on the table quickly what, what you know, what the therapy analogy is I saw it was about. Um, in, you know, in, in therapy, um, the, the patient comes with a, a problem, but but really, you know, that problem's not soluble in its own terms. There's some kind of unconscious belief underlying it, and and, and we, one has to kind of extirpate the un, 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 unconscious belief, and that can lead to the dissolving of the original problem rather than the, the solving of it. And um, and, and in, the person comes to therapy because they're getting in their own way in some way as well. They don't really understand why, but there's some kind of agency, as it were, at, at work, something maybe motivational in some sense, but, but, but which is leading to a kind of perverse outcome. Um, mm. and, and of course, yes, one could, one could reframe this in, in, in terms of liberation too. But I think that, that for me was what the kind of value of the, um, 
you know, therapeutic idea had in it. I mean, uh, in, in your book, I mean, you, you um, which I haven't, I've only just looked just earlier, just had a little look at the introduction. You, you, you've got worries, you know, um, about kind of aspects of therapy. Um, and it seemed to me that they, they were perhaps, as, they were, you know, worries about bad therapy, really. For example, you're worried about the kind of hierarchy and or, authority that can exist in the therapeutic relationship. And I guess I'd say, there is a reality to that. I mean, if I'm a, I'm a clinician, I have a certain kind of um, you know, skill set and, and, and can see things that the patient can't see, and that's precisely why they're coming to me. But at the same time, the patient comes because often, if say they're a depressed patient, it, it becomes because they've been unwittingly subordinating themselves to others, including to the therapist. And by analyzing the, the transference to the therapist, we can help them increase their self-possession. Um, uh, other things about the therapist, you, you, you were worried about them, they might be someone who doesn't think that they need therapy, but uh, I think that any decent therapist actually is someone who has had a hell of a lot of therapy um, and also obviously ongoing supervision. And is it anything you're right to say that, that a therapist who can present him or herself as kind of omniscient is, or is doing something to the patient, that would be a catastrophic, um, well, I'd say a catastrophic metaphor for philosophy, but also a catastrophic procedure in, 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 in therapy. Really, I think, Therapy has got to be an act of love that kind of discloses the individuality or the particularity of the of the patient and one that wants the best for her and it's the kind of opposite of intrusiveness and it occurs to me that thinking about therapy as an act of love in that way might actually tell us something if we could draw on some of that as a metaphor for what it might be to do philosophy that might be kind of radical in a, in a new way as well. Actually. Yeah, thanks, thanks Richard. Uh, again, lovely remarks and uh, much of that I'm very sympathetic with. Um, Let's let's focus in on the on the hierarchy point for a, for a moment. So so you said, well, look, there is some hierarchy in therapy, and that's sort of fair enough. Um, so um, I guess here I'm I've I've been struck for many years by some of the uh, attempts to overcome uh, that hierarchy. For example, in co-counseling. For example, in, in Sandor uh, Ferenczi's uh, mutual analysis. Um, uh, and my thought is right now, not necessarily about the benefits of those, although I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed with both of them. Uh, but my thought is, aren't those potentially a, a better model for philosophy? Because there is a serious danger if we import any um, serious amount of hierarchy over into the philosophical uh, uh, model. Um, because um, in philosophy, well, certainly at any rate, when, we're, when we get to the point of doing philosophy like this, when we're doing, you know, philosophical research in a sort of collaborative, mutually uh, Socratic, whatever kind of way, um, it would be troubling if there were that uh, level of hierarchy. And I genuinely think that there um, isn't in the sense that, yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got some um, knowledge to take into the, um, uh, the therapeutic encounter in a way that it would, it would be questionable for me to say, I have knowledge to take into this philosophical encounter that, that others in the room here today uh, don't have. So that's really the, the point, that in as much as there is something um, uh, going for the idea of hierarchy uh, in therapy, then it's a potentially troubling um, metaphor for philosophy. Um, and here's where I see uh, the, the concept of liberation as offering um, us something um, uh, uh, less exposed to risk um, because of the way that I argue that such liberation um, must be something that is um, uh, mutual uh, and happens um, together. And because of the way that I seek to conceive of uh, liberation uh, as the opening up of a kind of a space of autonomy where we, where we find ourselves with the, the freedom to, to choose between one picture uh, uh, and another or, or none at all. Uh, and that this is something, this, this space is itself something that, that we carve out together, um, roughly speaking, in spaces uh, uh, like this. Um, so again, you know, uh, I've been for many years was a, a apps, there was no, no stronger advocate of the therapeutic um, um, uh, metaphor than myself, and, and it's not as if I kind of chucked it all out. It's just that I've come to see some of the potential problems uh, with it, and come to think that liberation is less exposed uh, to those problems. And one of those problems is uh, to do, I think, with the with the point you made quite fairly about uh, about um, hierarchy. 
I certainly like the idea that neither you or I would want to put ourselves in the philosophical kind of hierarchy, as it were, and that there's yeah. some mutuality there. And yeah. I, 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 guess, I guess it will be the case that some philosophers have more skills than others and the non-philosophers, and they'll perhaps, you know, have a set of expertise that they'll be able to bring to bear on certain yeah. kind of models. And of course, some of that. And of course, you know, I have my students and there's a reason why they're, they're the students and I'm the teacher uh, and so on. But there's a, there's a way in which that kind of comes to an end. Uh, and also, even there, the extent to which I can, I can actually uh, appeal to uh, anything worth calling uh, uh, knowledge to sort of put the student in their place and so on is extremely limited uh, in, in philosophy, unlike many other academic disciplines, notably uh, science and uh, technological uh, uh, disciplines. Um, so super, thank you. Right, we've got loads of questions stacking up now. Let's go to Zhang Zhu next. And after that, I'll come to Rob uh, and to Moore and Mark and Andrew, and I'd like to invite um, women on the call to also put themselves uh, in the queue. Uh, so uh, Zhang Zhu, if you want to ask your question or make your comment, please. Okay, thank you, Professor Reed, and thank you, Professor Morris. And uh, recently, uh, I'm a Chinese uh, Chinese scholar. I just uh, um, I just graduated, uh, get my PhD degree uh, in the 2017, and my PhD dissertation is about the Weizmann's interpretation and the development of Wittgenstein, Middle Wittgenstein's philosophy of language, just in Chinese. So that's why I'm very kind of curious about, you know, very interested about your topic. And here I've got, got two questions, you know, separately, first now is on Friedrich Weizmann, and then is on, on Baker's view. Uh, and, you know, in, in, in Weizmann's, um, the article which was published in 1956, this, this is how I see philosophy. So I found that in, in later Weizmann, his idea of philosophy is, I mean, just like Hacker said, you know, uh, he's just going far away from the uh, middle Wittgenstein. And uh, sometimes he even criticized about Wittgenstein's view. So as is to the, uh, to the therapeutic view. And for my, for my uh, understanding, I, I don't think there is, isn't any uh, therapeutic philosophy which was Crystallized, crystallized in 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 Weizmann's um, paper or his writings. And by the way, in my perception, uh, Weizmann might uh, have a like you said, liberatory or the freedom freedom. Right? He often talk about the free philosophy, is like free. But I mean, I I, I cannot just uh, figure out. Uh, I mean, we cannot just uh, find too much uh, proofs than to justify. I mean. Wittgenstein has any therapeutic, therapeutic, therapeutic uh, understanding, right? And this is a, the one point. And another point is that, and I also I just- might, I wonder if we might take that point, Zhang Zhu, and then maybe come back to the second point, because that's already uh, well, quite a bit. Or are they closely linked? Oh, uh, yes. All right, okay, you carry on then. Okay. So both their bigger and, you know, I know just like uh, they have many disagreements about the, uh, Wittgenstein and uh, in your, uh, I, I wonder if you know, uh, you use the word we, in my perception, we means like the Wittgenstein, Weizmann or Murray Schilling, you know, that we, and you say the we is that you like use that as the uh, us, right? As it's, I mean, their connotation about that, that word is different in, in, in Weizmann's uh, notebooks, which you know, which was on the conversations between Wittgenstein and the Wiener Circle in that the voices of Wittgenstein in that book. So I mean, the we, I mean, in that chapter about philosophy, uh, I know I found uh, I found too much uh, proofs about the, the 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 writings which is about that topic is theory of philosophy. I mean, the big type big type script, you know, in the chapter, and the Wittgenstein, and sometimes say uh, he, he he is just curing the curing the, the philosophers, right? I mean, the theory of philosophy, this is a, the direct uh, proof I, I can find from that book. So, and right. that's why a lot of scholars, they criticize about Baker's view. I mean, particularly about later Baker's view about the theoretical, therapeutic uh, understanding, right? So I don't think, uh, in my perception, I think uh, both, uh, I mean, there is no uh, direct, direct um, proof, uh, which can be justified, can be used as a, a proof to justify the theory of beauty of Wittgenstein. 
and uh, for 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 bigger, I think okay. bigger might just went too far. That's my point. Okay. Right. Okay. Very interesting. So <laughs> I'm going to say just a few words, and then I'll hand over to Catherine, who may wish to make a more substantive okay, uh, or substantial you. response. Um, so I I offer a, a, an outline criticism of uh, of Weissman uh, in in the introduction to to the book, um, uh, and you know I'm not claiming that uh, that Weissman and Wittgenstein are well aligned, except on the question of liberation. Uh, and there I think that there is a, a deep alignment and that is obviously fundamental and foundational. So what I'm trying to do in the book is to take that idea of, of liberation um, uh, as it gets developed then by, uh, by Gordon Baker um, and then uh, apply it uh, to uh, Wittgenstein's uh, book, to apply it to the philosophical investigations. Um, uh, and as I do so to seek to see where there are also some limitations in in Baker's interpretation as well, but I, I argue that this, this concept which Weissman began and that Baker extended works really well. Now, obviously, I can't prove that here in, on this call. Uh, I have to invite you to, to read the book and, and see if you, uh, if you agree. But, but that's, the, that's the approach. I'm not trying to say uh, that Wittgenstein um, is in most respects a Weissmanian. I'm trying to say that this one absolutely uh, original insight of, uh, of Weissmann's, in my opinion, um, fits uh, the philosophical investigations text very, very closely, much more closely than people have uh, realized and um, much more closely, or at least at much more length than the therapeutic analogy. As is well known, um, therapy only features um, explicitly um, in uh, PI 133. Uh, you can argue it's implicit in uh, most of the next uh, 70 passages or 70 sections or so, but it's very implicit. You can argue it's kind of there in 255. Um, I seek to show that, that liberation is there implicitly or explicitly again and again and again in the book. But again, all I can do there really is invite you to, to, to read the book. Um, uh, Catherine, what would you say to Zhang's uh, question? Thank you. Um... The, the points that you're making, I think, are very much echo the kinds of points that Hacker made in that criticism of the later Baker, um, uh, posthumously written, which I must say annoys me. Um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, um, but I will very happily send you my response, uh, which is um, it, it's been published in a, uh, you may have seen it already, but it's been published in a, in a volume um, on Weissman, uh, edited by Stuart Shapiro and um, Dejan Oh, yes, yes, I have that book. Yeah, yeah. So the response I made there is really, um, it seems to me that I think Baker could perhaps be criticized for overemphasizing the word therapy and that, that really the point the points that come through in the analogies that he draws between Wittgenstein's method and what Weissman is talking about in how we see philosophy mm -hmm. are these twin con <coughs> twin concepts we haven't talked about the second one much but freedom on the one hand and the notion of a vision on the other. Yes, inside. Um, yeah, so those, those seem to be the two things that really are important for Baker in his reading of, of Wittgenstein. And that he frames them within a therapeutic um, uh, framework may or may not be that important. Um, that the important thing really does seem to be freedom and vision. Um, I, that is vision meaning yeah. on the one hand, yeah, yeah, ways of looking at things and on the other yes. hand, uh, yeah, so develop, you know, being caught in within a way of looking at things, but being then freed from that and free to look at things otherwise. Um, so in one sense, I absolutely agree with you, um, uh, but I'm not going to see it as a huge criticism of Baker, uh, but rather simply uh, that he perhaps did overemphasize the word therapy when what what he really meant was freedom and vision. Yeah. yeah. 
and that and that's very yeah. much what I try to Thank to you. bring out. Yeah. In, in Actually, I'm writing a, a research plan about the new Wittgenstein study. And I'll apply, apply in, in, in my country for the for the National Science Social Science Fund. Well, we okay. hope you get it. We hope you get it. Yeah, so, I'm, right, I'm writing. I'm writing the plan. Excellent. Good. Uh, okay. Rob, over to you. Yeah, it's just a very minor observation, um, Rupert, but it's related to the things that um, that um, Ian raised and that came up in your discussion with Richard. But it's about that part, I think it's in about 0 0.8 of your summary, where you ask the question, does Wittgenstein make uh, issue commands or make requests? And you say, certainly not commands, but requests. It's this issue of what is this um, first person plural or um, second person viewpoint that we are trying to make real and it reminded me of, oh, uh, you know, it came up in your discussion with Richard as well, when the issues of a kind of non-hierarchical um, or non-impositional therapy, where the phrase, you came up phrases like, we carve out together, which I thought was very good. Mm -hmm. And we, get, but in, in your summary of that chapter in the, or in the final part of the book, you, you say we engage in a practice. It reminded me of um, something Roger Scruton wrote talking about aesthetics and it is to the effect that in aesthetic judgments, we are suitors for agreement, mm. which I thought was quite felicitous mm. way of putting it. Yeah. And then it made me think also that the strange thing about our problems of taste and aesthetic judgments is that they cut so deep between friends that an aesthetic disagreement can cut very deep between close friends. And it's a strange phenomenon and why, but it's something, but the idea that in aesthetic judgments we are suitors for agreement, in the effect, in the end of the day, in much of what I was reading in, in this paper or this summary of yours, this was absolutely fascinating. It's, it's not only there, it's in logic and ethics, we are suitors for concurrency or agreement as well. And that's part of what the, the problem of the first person plural is. And so I just thought that there's an aesthetic, aesthetics, not just logic and, and um, you know, logic and ethics come into it, but aesthetics is an illustrative mm. ground for the sort of concerns you have as well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Rob. That's uh, lovely. I don't have much to say. I, I agree with what you're saying there. Um, I think uh, someone who brings out the kind of phenomenon that you're you're interested in there very well is Stanley Cavell, who is a, yes, a, key, oh, absolutely. a yes. key influence on, on my book. I don't discuss him very much, but he, he's, yeah. his presence and his presence as a, as a sort of mentor and teacher is, is, is there, I hope, at a, at a number of points mm. um, uh, uh, in the book. Um, in terms of the, uh, the first person plural, uh, um, for example, um, uh, just let me uh, be clear that I, I'm not making some kind of uh, uh, claim that we can always uh, help ourselves to first person plurals, not at all. Right. Often they need to be um, established or negotiated or yeah, you one needs to be a, a suitor. Um, but um, the claim is more that they, they, are, they are sometimes uh, very real and can be taken for granted uh, and should be uh, allowed to figure uh, in discussions of the second person rather than those discussions as too often they have been in philosophy being restricted to the interaction between one single individual and another single individual. Yes. That's really what I'm trying to, to get mm -hmm. beyond. Um, mm -hmm. Ian, do you want to respond to Rob at all? Um, probably not at the moment. Fine. Um, let's go next to uh, Timur. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, congrats uh, with oh, your book. That's, that's Mark. Okay, we'll go to you, Mark. You go, you go ahead. Oh, yeah. no, you're right. You're right. Go oh, ahead. 
I didn't know there was another mark. Um, okay, uh, just quickly then. Um, so <clears throat> I, when I read the term liberatory, I, I have um, some political connotations in mind. And I wonder um, how you see the relation with what you did in this book, which is about liberation from patterns of thought, um, which is about this ethical relation in, 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 in this therapeutic context, the second person. How do you see the relation between that and the sort of you know, global politics, let's put, you know, to... to, to, yeah. to um, so, so, you know, that, does what you did in the book scale to, to that, dealing with that kind of problems? Do you see links there? And maybe there's a lot already in the book about this, but I, I didn't have a chance to, to read it. But it would sure, be very sure. nice. Yeah. yeah, thanks. So we'll be discussing some of this at the meeting I advertised at the start in, in a couple of weeks time. Um, but briefly, uh, yeah, or at least I hope so. Um, as I may, said in my opening remarks, one of the key things I'm trying to do in the book um, is to carve out this space of uh, freedom that gets carved out uh, together um, and to uh, make clear how that needs to not result in a fetishization of, uh, of freedom. And such fetishization is what I think we actually have, um, well, increasingly in the world today. Uh, and certainly um, uh, in, uh, in English speaking countries and more generally really across most of the developed world where we um, claim to be uh, uh, um, societies that are uh, essentially interested in people being uh, free. Uh, and we uh, are um, dominated, um, uh, I would say to a quite significant extent by uh, liberal political philosophy, liberal individualist um, political uh, philosophy. Uh, you can see extreme versions of this, of course, of this fetishization in uh, libertarianism. Um, Crucially, um, a point that I make in passing um, in the book is that um, I've used words like allegedly, because of course it, it won't be difficult for many of us to, to talk about ways in which actually uh, there, is, there is far less freedom than is advertised uh, in our societies. Um, and uh, in particular, I make the point that, that even freedom of thought uh, is actually um, uh, far less uh, available or far less practiced than people um, claim. Um, partly because of these uh, various hegemonic uh, ideologies being typically uh, uh, unchallenged. Um, uh, and I make the suggestion um, that uh, individualism um, isn't actually really uh, uh, the, um, the operating system of our society. It's a kind of pseudo individualism. Actually, um, we have uh, vast amounts of, uh, of ideologically driven conformism um, and uh, a, a great deal of difficulty in, uh, in thinking uh, independently. So the very thing which societies like the USA and the UK pride themselves on most of all, that they are spaces for freedom of thought, freedom of speech, um, uh, for the practice of, of some kind of liberal individualist um, uh, quasi-utopia. The very thing that they pride themselves I, on, I claim, is in fact um, not achieved and not available and actively undermined uh, by the way that uh, freedom is fetishized and various forms of conformism uh, and, ref and failure to interrogate hegemony um, are practiced. So yeah, I, in that sense, I definitely hope uh, that the book uh, contributes to, to setting out what it would actually be um, for, uh, for uh, a people or a society or, 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 or a world um, to, uh, to start to move in the direction of, um, of liberation. Does that make sense, Mark? That certainly makes sense. <laughs> Great. Um, Timur, um, over to you. Thanks, Rupert. You're a little quiet, Timur. Thank you very much, Rupert, for the presentation of your book. I have uh, two little questions uh, because I have uh, had the chance to read some earlier chapters of your book, earlier versions of the chapters. You certainly did, thank you. And uh, I, well, in the previous exchange, you already provided some elements, but the question is simply about your criticism of individuality. I would like to, because I know, I mean, seems to me that it's a bit an inflection in your thoughts 
that you that you often less critic of uh, individual individualism than uh, you sounded to me at least uh, today. So I wanted to ask you to precise a bit more uh, the criticism of individualism in the team. And uh, and my second question concerns the question of hierarchy and how you will you position your thoughts with respect to uh, that of Cabell in uh, in your book. Mm. Well, look, um, obviously there's much more I could say on the first question, but I'm slightly inclined not to, as we've only got half an hour left. I've already tried to say something about it. Um, so let me just uh, take the, 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 the second question. So um, when Alice Crary and I were putting together the, the new Wittgenstein, um, frighteningly, um, about uh, 25 years ago now, we started uh, putting it together. Um, uh, one of the things we did was we had a, a, a conversation with, uh, well, I had a conversation with Stanley Cavell uh, uh, about it. Uh, uh, and he expressed uh, great enthusiasm um, uh, for, the, for the project and for being included in the book. Um, but he wanted to make clear um, his, um, his reservations about the, the therapy um, uh, picture. Um, um, and and his reservations at the time, uh, I wasn't um, necessarily um, uh, very impressed by, uh, and nor was Alice. Uh, Alice, of course, wrote the introduction to the new Wittgenstein and, and placed the therapeutic uh, metaphor very centrally in it. But I have since come to revise my opinion somewhat. And I think if I were able to, to speak to Stanley now, which unfortunately is not possible, uh, I would say to him something like, um, yeah, I think you were kind of right, really. Um, that um, there are there are places where the therapeutic um, uh, metaphor uh, runs into uh, limitations um, as a metaphor for philosophical practice, um, uh, and I very much hope uh, that the uh, the picture that I've uh, put together in this book uh, does a, a better job of uh, reflecting how we want that practice to be, um, of reflecting the text of the investigations and of potentially helping a little bit to, uh, to inflect uh, the kind of uh, society and world uh, we live in, um, or at least through um, being uh, relevant to the kind of thinking and action that myself and others are doing um, uh, in sort of um, political and intellectual spheres that, uh, that uh, might uh, uh, be, uh, be um, um, influenced in some, uh, in some small way uh, by the kind of work that I've sought to do uh, in the book. Um, I hope that might answer your your second question. Yeah? Your answer, Robert. Cheers, Timur. Um, Andrew Lug, great to have you here, Andrew. What do you want to say? Um, a few grumpy remarks. Can you hear me? Because sometimes people can't hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I'm very much on your side on your political pro projects, and I admire and appreciate your work on Wittgenstein. What bothers me or what I don't feel comfortable with is your bringing these together. See, it seems to me that Wittgenstein is a very tricky customer. And what we don't need at the moment with all the problems you mentioned are tricky customers. <laughs> uh, let, me t let me give you a couple of remarks, uh, which may at least make my point a bit clearer. You talk a lot about liberation. This puts me in mind of when years ago, when I was a teacher, I would get, read out to students a passage, which was about liberation. It was wonderful. And all the students thought it was great. And then I asked them, who wrote this? And they didn't know, but it was Mussolini. Liberators, <laughs> liberators we have to watch out for. A liberation, <laughs> the whole idea of liberation is not so straightforward. We want the right sort of liberation. We don't want the wrong sort. And that means that we've got to discuss these things. And that means we can't do it in a general way. We have to do it case by case. Let me just say one other thing. Um, you mentioned about pictures um, and that we're 
we're in the grip of uh, we're we're in the grip of a picture. Well, Wittgenstein, that's a tricky question with Wittgenstein. You know, what does he mean when he's talking about being in the grip of a picture? He says it in a particular context. And this is the person, a writer, who has pictures galore. He's giving all sorts of pictures. So once again, there are good pictures and there are bad pictures. The, the hard thing is to distinguish between these two. <laughs> That's why I say he's a tricky customer, and almost everything one says about him can be can be conjured two ways. And this is what I don't see we need when it comes to, you know, the major problems facing facing us at the time, which you are so much involved with, and I think are so important. Mm. Well, thanks, Andrew. Really thoughtful uh, comments, as always, from yourself. Um, look, obviously, I agree we need the right sort of liberation. Um, uh, 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 and yeah, I want to uh, uh, to uh, to help us uh, attain to good or helpful uses of pictures as opposed to unhelpful ones. Um, um, I hope uh, that in my remarks about the way in which um, the book stands explicitly against the fetishization of, uh, of freedom or the kind of um, simplistic vision of liberation that you get um, in libertarianism. And also I would argue uh, in um, most contemporary identity politics. Um, and I briefly say that uh, at the end of the book. Um, I hope that uh, that, that goes some way towards uh, satisfying you. Um, in other words, um, what, what I'm offering in the book is I, I hope, and if it's not this, it's nothing, a quite you know, sophisticated version of what a liberation is and of how not to get caught in it, of how not to get captured uh, by it. Now, of course, that's not gonna be very easy to translate into, into real politics. Um, but, but let me just say this. Um, firstly, as I, as I sketched a little while ago when I was talking about what I mean by uh, autonomy, um, the, the freedom that I see Wittgenstein opening up for us is a freedom to be able to, to look at and pick and choose between pictures and to start to come to see when pictures have been holding us captive, including in politics. And I think this is really important and that it is possible. And I wanna go back to an example I briefly mentioned earlier, the example of the concept of progress. So I believe that the concept of progress has uh, catastrophically deformed uh, our politics uh, and it is explicit in, uh, in Wittgenstein that he's a, a critic uh, of, uh, of that concept. Uh, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, and that is an example of the kind of thing uh, that I mean when I talk about how liberatory philosophy might be able to uh, offer us some help in thinking about the political sphere. See, I, I'm, I'm with you on the specifics, but not on the general generalities. And, um, you know, Wittgenstein on progress is, is a perfect example of a tricky customer. You know, he says he's in the, in the preface of which what was put in the preface of the um, philosophical remarks, I mean, is a very yeah. dodgy um, few paragraphs. One can read those all sorts of ways, and they're very difficult. Um, just as, uh, you know, when Carnap talks about progress, it's very difficult to, one has to do a lot of work. And I don't see that, on the other hand, of course, Wittgenstein, when it came to music, was not so interested in progress in music, right? He thought it all finished with Brahms and Labor. Um, you know, he's not so good, not so good on the Vienna school. Um, so, you know, all these things are open for discussion. That's my feeling. Not, I'm not criticizing. But sure, I, I'm not trying to shut politics. down. Uh, yeah, I, I'm far from, <laughs> as, as Catherine said, I'm not trying to, I, I'm far from trying to shut down uh, discussion. Um, and, and I totally agree with you that the remarks on progress uh, require some elucidation. Um, I hope to have given that elucidation uh, here in this book and, and in other previous publications, but uh, you know that would uh, that would be another another discussion. Uh, so thanks, Andrew. Uh, let's go to Camilla Cronquist. 
Hi, Camilla. Yes. Uh, hi, Rupertin. Thank you for this you. conversation that you've been having. Yes, me too. And to Catherine E and too for their comments. Um, I I wanted to come back a bit to to the question of of the therapy and and uh, the problems with the hierarchical relationship you seem to sort of point yeah. out. Uh, and and I mean I clearly agree that there is a problem there and that philosophy should be a sort of communal endeavor and that Wittgenstein's philosophy can really make us see in what way a certain form of community and cooperation in action is central to sort of language use on the whole. So we can sort of get a view of who we are through being language users, which is really relational. Um, mm. Yeah. But, but then I wondered, I, I mean, lately I've been thinking about uh, sort of the very pedagogical character of much of Wittgenstein's writing. I mean, how he's, because one way of saying, okay, one way of trying to save therapy was saying, okay, it's therapy on yourself, which seems in some ways to be right for some therapeutic <laughs> Wittgensteinians, but not really for Wittgenstein. Because one of the questions that constantly that he constantly struggles with is sort of how to make his thinking or certain ideas, I mean, relevant to others or make others see his thinking. Mm -hmm. so, and here, it seems like we have a different kind of hierarchical relationship between sort of teacher and student. Um, but then again, it's not the same thing as we have between therapists and the one receiving therapy or in need of therapy. Mm, mm. So, so this is just, I, I, I have no clear idea where I'm going with this. I just wanted to see if you thought about this kind of aspect and had some comment to it. Yeah, wow, it's a lovely question. I would really have to reflect on it um, to give it any um, sufficient uh, uh, answer. I, I will try to reflect on it uh, properly. Um, just off the cuff, I would uh, I would say that um, that somebody who has thought about this uh, very well, I think, is Juliette Floyd. I'm thinking of her um, uh, paper um, in that book on loneliness. Do you know that one? Um, which was really the the first uh, paper to try to develop what became called a, a Jacobin uh, reading of the Tractatus. Um, uh, which I myself uh, broadly uh, adhere to, um, uh, in which uh, uh, Juliet argued that um, a really helpful uh, lens through which to see Wittgenstein's intellectual um, struggles is the lens of loneliness in the sense that he um, felt that there was pretty much nobody at all uh, who uh, understood uh, what he was trying to say. Um, and, and she suggests that there is a kind of connection between that and the sense in which he actually isn't trying to say anything. Um, so uh, th th that's a sort of you know, partial resolution of the paradox, but it's only partial because people have found it very, very difficult to understand the possibility that that is what he might have been trying to say, if you understand me. Uh, in other words, it took a very long time for anyone to get anywhere near, I would argue, um, understanding uh, uh, what's going on in the Tractatus, what the method of the Tractatus is. It seems to me we only started to get that with people like um, uh, uh, Winch and, uh, and, and McGuinness, and, and we only really got close to it with, uh, with people like Diamond and Conant, and then people like uh, Floyd and, and Goldfarb. Um, so that's really all I've got uh, right now um, is the thought that uh, yes, uh, there there must be something right about the, your thought that um, there is uh, there is something important there. I, I wouldn't be particularly inclined to talk about it in terms of hierarchy, uh, as I argue in in this book. Um, uh, one of the crucial things about being a, a properly Wittgensteinian philosopher is you really do always have to be open to the possibility that you're wrong and you really do ha always have to be open to the possibility that you just haven't understood what the other person is trying to say. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's something um, valuable there in your thought that, um, 
that um, we need to take seriously the, the, the great difficulty Wittgenstein felt in, uh, in being um, understood. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Reflect on in turn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. And maybe we'll talk about it um, in the future. Um, we've got Cristiano and then Priambada and then we'll uh, uh, wrap up. Cristiano. Well, can, well, can you hear me? We can. Well, in first place, congratulations on the book. Uh, the introduction was indeed quite interesting. So I have a very short question. Uh, the book has this major key, liberation, and the minor key, ethics. My question addresses the minor key with which I have struggled a little and maybe some of the presence here, especially with regard to the second person point of view. Uh, I wouldn't like to be repetitive. So uh, as you said in the introduction, I shall suggest instead first person plural and second personal including second personal plural, IU, plural modes as focal. The jumping off point for this suggestion is the very manner in which Wittgenstein writes the philosophic investigation. So yeah. uh, could you develop this idea of philosophizing and writing in second person, but in responding to it, I would like that you could comment on the style of Wittgenstein, his diacritics, which was a very interesting part of, of the introduction, or when he uses second person when philosophizes, when writing. So that's it. Right, well, thanks, Cristiano. Um, gosh, um, th there's so much one could say there. Uh, I, and I hope to have said uh, a fair bit of it um, in, the, in the body of the, of the book. Um, one of the claims I make uh, in the book um, is that um, I'm able to understand uh, something of Wittgenstein's style and to see it as a virtue rather than a, a vice. Whereas it seems to me that nearly all previous, not all, but nearly all previous interpreters of Wittgenstein sooner or later reach a point where they find themselves saying things like, uh, well, Wittgenstein here is obscurely saying this. Uh, and then they try to, to say what it is that he was allegedly obscurely um, uh, saying. Uh, whereas as you say, um, for me, uh, the, 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 the peculiar diacritics, for example, are absolutely uh, essential to, to the form uh, and, if you will, the content of the saying. Um, I could, there's so much more I could say, but um, I, 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 it would, uh, there's also, you know, sort of everything and nothing. Um, I'm slightly inclined to bat the, uh, bat the question on to Catherine, who might wish to say something uh, about this because it, Cristiano's question brings to mind for me your important. Um, article in Philosophical Quarterly, which influenced me uh, um, in the book uh, about, about the, um, um, the sort of indexical, et cetera, character of Wittgenstein's writing. Catherine, do you want to take up that invitation? I'm not sure I can at the moment. Um, you, you've sort of thrown me in it at the moment. Uh, here, Rupert. Yeah, don't feel obliged. I just thought you might have something to say about, about um, about uh, the way that um, that, uh, that Wittgenstein's uh, use of you know of uh, of peculiar uses of repetitions and of, and of quotation marks and so on, you know, you're sort of building there on on later Baker on on how we need to we need to take this seriously and how philosophy hasn't tended to to take it very seriously. I don't know what else to say apart from that. I mean, the fact is that Wittgenstein was constantly writing and rewriting um, and what what comes out in the in the investigations um, is something that he was more or less happy with putting forward for publication at a certain stage and so on um, and of course Rupert you too use a lot of interesting you know orthography and yeah italics and bowls and and all these kinds of things in order to uh, well to do multiple things at, multi at, at, at di on different occasions but, but i mean the the most important thing which i kind of felt i wanted to say to andrew lug as well when he was talking about good pictures and bad pictures is the huge importance of context you know something can be you know 
italics might mean one thing in one context and something entirely different in a uh, different context. And likewise, a picture can be really bad in certain contexts and really good in other contexts and so on and so on. But that probably doesn't at all say what you would have said, Rupert. So. No, th thank you. It's interesting. Uh, and thank you for mentioning the, the my own slightly peculiar style, which I like to think is... Uh, uh, is a sort of inheritance of, uh, of Wittgenstein's style, and, and you know I do firmly believe that one can't do philosophy philosophy adequately um, in uh, in very plain prose. At least if what one wants to do in philosophy is the kind of thing at all that Wittgenstein uh, 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 wanted to do. Uh, and I, there's a kind of inheritance here for me also from the some of the founding texts of the Resolute uh, reading. I'm thinking of uh, um, Diamond's uh, Throwing Away the Ladder and of Conant's um, amazing piece, Must We Show What We Cannot Say, um, where I take them to be um, suggesting that um, any thought that, that what one centrally accomplishes uh, in philosophy uh, can be um, 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 characterized in terms of um, uh, statings of, of things which can be received by others uh, as propositions is just bound to be uh, inadequate. Uh, and they demonstrate that in those papers with, a, with I think a lovely sort of literary uh, style themselves, especially Conant's Must We Show What We Cannot Say. Um, I'm gonna move on with, uh, forg 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 forgive me Cristiano for not giving a more complete answer. We are getting very close to the end. I'm gonna move on to a final question from Pian Bada. And then after that, I'm going to invite uh, Ian and Catherine to make any closing remarks they wish to make, reflecting on the discussion we've had for the last hour. So Priyambada. Thank you so much. Uh, I was uh, really enriched by uh, your uh, book and the way you expressed and other learned uh, participants. Uh, I was wondering that uh, whether Wittgenstein himself was liberating himself from his early contention in the Tractatus that there is some truth in solipsism, from solipsistic language and also from uh, the uh, despotic language of philosophical remarks, uh, where he had some inclination to uh, to, to think that there is some truth, there, there is some truth in thinking that uh, I have been has some special status. Uh, was he trying to liberate his, himself in his later thinking? And the second question is, as uh, Wittgenstein was opposed to any sort of theorization in his later philosophy, can we really attribute liberatorial thinking or therapeutic thinking like as, a, as an ism to later Wittgenstein? Thank you. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so on the second question, I can give you a fairly straightforward answer. That, that's the, the point of what I'm trying to do when I say we must not fetishize freedom, we must not turn uh, the idea of liberatory philosophy into something that we are compelled to do on pain of a sort of performative self-contradiction, as Catherine uh, remarked um, earlier. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't turn it into an ism, uh, yeah. and I would be uh, opposed to, to any attempt to make it sort of dogmatically uh, compulsory. Uh, your first question um, is really interesting, uh, and uh, I'm not really sure what to what to say about it. Um, one thing I could say is that I uh, clearly I think that there are certain respects in which later Wittgenstein was trying to liberate himself from uh, his earlier thinking from the eggshells that uh, that clung to him. But as a resolute reader, of course, um, I argue that those uh, what he was trying to liberate himself from has been typically misrepresented and in particular over uh, represented. In other words, that actually um, the Tractatus had already uh, liberated uh, Wittgenstein or its um, ideal reader from a great deal of what people attribute to it as its uh, doctrine. 
Uh, in chapter four of the book, for example, I try to lay out how when you look at what Wittgenstein says uh, in the investigations about uh, his conception of philosophy, actually an awful lot of that um, uh, is already present in another form in the Tractatus. And there are only certain quite important but specific uh, um, uh, reconceptions um, that, uh, that uh, turn the investigations into something glorious and new uh, and even better uh, than the Tractatus, which clearly uh, um, it is. Uh, in terms of the sort of broader dimensions of your question about solipsism, I think that really goes back to what uh, Camilla and I were, were talking about. I think there is a, a sort of intriguing way in which um, Wittgenstein uh, uh, remained um, um, uh, concerned throughout his life uh, ab about the extent to which he was actually uh, succeeding uh, in joining uh, a community of ideas or in create or, or, or in creating uh, a community uh, of ideas um, and there's some interesting remarks in going on in the chat about that but but uh, I think it would be uh, again impossible to, for us to uh, uh, to um, settle that question here and maybe settling it wouldn't even be desirable um, right we are coming to the end here um, I'm gonna go briefly to Catherine and Ian to see if they've got uh, reflections on the discussion that we've been having or any final remarks they would like uh, to make. I'll come to Catherine first. Hi, I, I just want to make two very brief remarks. Um, one, I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna sound like a technophile when I say this, <laughs> but isn't it amazing that we had 79 people from all over the world participating in this conversation. I just think it's such a great pity that we only yeah. had two hours so that not everybody had a chance to actually speak up. But it is, there is something rather wonderful about that. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing, uh, I, I think it, this is the one ver of many downsides of technology that you missed. Um, uh, Ian's yes. uh, the, the first two thirds of what Ian had to say, um, and I, I, I've I've not met Ian before, and it's really nice to meet you. But I I just wanted to say I particularly loved what you said, Ian, about attention as um, a more moral act in itself. Um, and of course, Rupert has been uh, in in his book talks quite a lot about uh, attention. I think that's something. That's a point that we really, we didn't really get to talk about in, in, in our discussion, but I thought that was just such a wonderful point and something that we really need to think about a lot. I'll stop there. Mm. Thanks, Catherine. Mm. Ian, last word to you. Well, I, I would really very much um, support what Catherine said about how amazing it is that you've organized this and it's worked and I've learned an awful lot in the last couple of hours. Um, but I think the really wonderful thing that you emphasize is the, his undogmatic, Wittgenstein's undogmatic refusal of dogma and his almost uncertain refusal of certainty. I think this is terribly important. And of course, as you know, aligns with um, what I think is very special about the, the, the hemispheric balance when one starts to favor the right hemisphere more and moves away from uh, dogma and and so forth so um it, it was lovely um a wonderful uh, philosophical world you conjured and i very much enjoyed reading your book and i hope lots of other people do too oh thank you ian thank you catherine thank you everybody for coming i yeah i, I confess uh, it's felt a, a splendid uh, event to me if you've enjoyed it and you want more uh, do come to the uh, event that's at the start of the, the chat uh, uh, earlier uh, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, where myself, Thomas Walgren, and um, Asim Shukistava will be delving further into the political and cultural aspects of the, uh, of the book. Um, uh, it only remains for me to say um, uh, thanks to everyone who's come uh, and uh, a goodbye uh, for now. Uh, I'm going to leave the meeting over for a little while in case people want to uh, put stuff in the in the chat to each other, etc. So I'll leave it open for another five or ten minutes. But uh, yeah, that's the end of official business. Thanks, everybody. And please remember a final point before I stop the recording. Here's the book. Uh, don't buy it. Uh, get it for your library. OK, thank you.
Bye. Cheers, Ian.